Hello everyone and welcome to Delta Q Technologies webinar on the EU Stage 5 regulation for non-road mobile machinery. Today, we're going to discuss the EU Stage 5 regulation, which is currently the toughest emission standard for off-highway machinery in Europe. Our total time for this webinar is 30 minutes. This is an on-demand webinar, so please watch this at your own pace. We recommend that you grab a notebook and pen to jot down your questions in duration of the webinar. And once the webinar is over, please submit your questions to marketing at deltaq.com. We have also created a frequently asked questions document, which we will send to you once the webinar is over. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Akanksha Kapil, Delta Q's marketing coordinator, and I will be today's webinar moderator. Some of you may be familiar with our company, but for those of you who are not, Delta Q Technologies is a leading manufacturer of battery chargers for lead acid and lithium ion batteries. We provide power management and power conversion solutions that improve the performance and durability of electric drive vehicles and industrial equipment for the global market. Our speaker today is Graham Harfman, Delta Q's Director of Product Management. Graham has over 20 years of experience building products for tech companies and will be leading the presentation. I will be coming in every so often to ask questions to help guide the discussion. The main purpose of today's presentation is to help original equipment manufacturers understand what the Stage 5 regulation is and how this will affect companies that currently sell to the European market or those looking to enter the market. To outline what we will discuss today, we will give an overview of the new Stage 5 regulation, how this re regulation will affect the future of non-road mobile machinery, and we will go over a few common options OEMs can adopt to electrify and case studies to give them a better understanding of what they can do to comply. And now I'll be passing it on to Graham. Thank you for the introduction, Akasha. Before I dive into details of the Stage 5 regulation, let's go over the history of Europe's non-road mobile machinery emissions regulations. Europe's non-road mobile machinery emissions regulation covers a wide variety of machinery that are typically used off public road. Obvious exceptions are farm machinery or road construction equipment that are used on public roads under specific circumstances. These categories are construction machinery, rail cars, locomotives and inland water vessels, agricultural and farming machinery, and small gardening and handheld equipment such as chainsaws. Non-road mobile machinery diesel or gasoline-fueled engines significantly contribute to the air pollution by emitting carbon oxides, nitrogen oxides, hydrocarbons, and other particulate matter. To tackle this problem, the European Union introduced the Non-Road Mobile Machinery Emissions Regulation to progressively reduce the amount of pollutant emissions, phase out equipment with the most polluting engines, and improve local air quality. The first European Directive on Gaseous and Particulate Pollutant Emissions Standards for Non-Road Mobile Machinery was adopted in 1977. This brought about emissions harmonization for all in-scope diesel engines intended for use in mobile machinery, such as construction machinery like excavators, bulldozers, and tarmac laying machines, as opposed to stationary or fixed machinery. The 1977 directive created stages one and two, and was later revised seven times over the last 20 years to bring in more stringent emission levels up to the stage five. In 2002, the 9768 EC directive extended the scope to apply stage one and two emission standards to gasoline engines up to 19 kilowatt. In 2004, stages 3A, 3B, and 4 were created and small gasoline engines such as lawnmowers and chainsaws and secondary engines on road vehicles such as a generator on a refrigerated lorry are added to the regulation scope. 3A and 3B were phased in from 2006 to 2013 and stage 4 came into force in 2014. In 2006, engines used in rail cars, locomotives and inland waterway vessels were brought into scope. In 2010, the testing and type approval requirements for Stage 3B and Stage 4 emission standards were modified. 
In 2011, flexibility in the compliance implementation for Stage 3B engines was revised. In 2012, the 9768 EC directive was updated to reflect the technical progress on emission measures. The current regulation in full effect is Stage 4, which is harmonized with the U.S. Tier 4 final non-road mobile machinery standard. Lastly, in 2016, the Stage 5 regulation was introduced. I've added a couple good reference documents to the end of this presentation with more background details. Before 2016, all these directives left it up to individual EU member states to modify their laws to achieve the intended outcomes listed in the directives. This resulted in 28 national laws being in effect. In addition to these 28 laws, regional amendments set supplementary requirements on engines sold and used in targeted areas, which resulted in countries like Germany, Switzerland, Austria, and the Netherlands having stricter requirements than the EU law. This created a multi-tiered regulation for OEMs selling into Europe. The reason the Stage 5 regulation was created was so that the whole European Union could follow one regulation and replace the existing multi-layered framework. Before we continue on, just a quick reminder to write down any questions you have and submit them to marketing at deltaq.com once the webinar is over. So Graham, could you please tell us what has changed between the Stage 4 and the Stage 5 regulation? Well, first of all, the Stage 5 regulation has widened the scope of engines under the regulation, which now includes compression ignition engines below 19 kilowatt and above 560 kilowatt, spark ignited engines above 19 kilowatt, and other previously unregulated engines such as railway locomotives, snowmobiles, ATVs, and side by sides. The Stage 5 regulation has also strengthened the emission limits for some engine categories, such as engines in the 19 to 37 kilowatt range and engines for inland waterway vessels. There is also a particle number emissions limit of 1 times 10 to the power of 12 particles per kilowatt hour for several categories of compression ignition engines between 19 to 560 kilowatts. Stage 5 new lower limit for particulate matter is 25% lower than the U.S. Tier 4 final standard and the new particulate number requirement are likely to require diesel particulate filters on 19 kilowatt to 560 kilowatt engines and may be a best practice for the rest of the world. The last improvement made is that all off-road vehicles require an in-service monitoring system using portable emissions measurement systems. This is similar to the requirements that apply to on-road heavy-duty vehicles under Euro 6 emissions standards and would start to apply to 56 kilowatt to 560 kilowatt non-road mobile machinery engines and may be extended to other engines in future amendments. In this graph, you see the significant improvement Stage 5 has made. The particulate matter limit is 97% lower than Stage 1, and the hydrocarbon and nitrogen oxide limits are 94% also lower than Stage 1. The new particulate matter limits combined with the new particulate number limit will likely require diesel particulate filter technology. Other industries that are affected by Europe's emissions regulations for non-road mobile machinery are engines above 560 kilowatt. Examples include mining trucks, locomotives, cargo ships, large agricultural tractors, and inland waterway transport. Engines below 19 kilowatt are also affected. Examples include gas-powered golf carts, compact excavators, snowmobiles, recreational boats, outdoor boom lifts, class four and five forklifts, and agricultural tractors. The type approval for Stage 5 is phasing in from January 2018 and continues on till January 2021 for different engine types. On January 1, 2019, engines below 56 kW and above 130 kW will need to comply, while engines between 56 kW to 130 kW will have to comply by January 2020. By January 2021, all new non-road engines entering the EU market 
will be stage five certified. There are a few exceptions such as snow blowers that can be found in the link at the bottom of the slide. Since the stage five regulation is looking to harmonize the entire European Union, who will be in charge for certifying engines for stage five? Good question, Akansha. For those looking to get certified, the certification body varies from country to country, but will be the local vehicle authority for that country. Okay, that's good to hear. So now that we've gotten a little background on what Stage 5 is and the history of the non-road mobile machinery emissions regulation in Europe, where do you see the future of non-road mobile machinery headed? Another good question, Akansha. Looking historically, the non-road mobile machinery OEMs have leveraged technology from the automotive sector, and there's no reason for that to change moving forward. Stage 5 is driving compliance and alignment with commercial and passenger automotive standards. Now, when we look at the rapid changes in the automotive sector, we see billions of dollars being invested in plug-in electric or hybrid electric technologies from batteries to electric motors, motor controllers, DC to DC converters, and charging stations. There are four main reasons why non-road mobile machinery OEM should look at electric options moving forward. Significant improvements in technology, particularly lithium battery technology, Stage 5 stricter regulations will continue to be amended. The internal combustion engine complexity is increasing to meet the standards and OEM costs will increase to implement Stage 5 requirement. Many segments of the non-road mobile machinery markets have electric options already and are now adopting or looking at lithium batteries. Looking to the future as OEMs evaluate Stage 5 implementation, I expect them to investigate plug-in hybrid and electric options for product moving forward. The first reason is improvements in technology. From 2016 to 2017, Europe's electric vehicle market grew by nearly 40% and is expected to continue to grow. With increasing demand for electric vehicles, we believe that this will lead to improvements in technology and will later help other markets adopt including non-road mobile machinery. Moreover, with Stage 5 regulations and future amendments, there will be an increase in the need for better emissions control and advanced exhaust gas treatment systems, which is likely to drive evaluations of electric or hybrid solutions. The second reason is stricter regulations. Recently, the United States, Japan, China, Europe, and India have been developing or have developed CO2 regulations for automotive with expectation of other markets to follow. There has also been increasing pressures on governments to improve local air quality and reduce noise pollution, which will result in more low emission zones, noise limits, and workplace regulations. Furthermore, Paris, Madrid, and Athens are aiming to ban diesel vehicles from city centers by 2025 while France and Britain have proposed banning new gasoline and diesel vehicles from 2040. These stricter regulations will, in turn, force original equipment manufacturers to electric or hybrid technology. The third reason is complexity. Meeting the Stage 5 regulations may require additional complex equipment for many manufacturers to achieve the nitrogen oxide and particulate matter reduction and the emissions monitoring system. Complex equipment may require additional service requirements, increasing operational and maintenance costs. The last reason is cost. Although electrifying is cheaper for lower powered applications, it does not currently apply to higher powered applications. This is because battery technology is limited and the additional parts that manufacturers require to electrify make it more expensive. However, with stricter regulations and environmental factors, there will be an increase in investment in technology that will drive down prices for batteries compared with current battery premiums, making electric and hybrid technologies more suitable for higher powered applications. One school of thought is that hybrid is a stepping stone to electric only machines, and as lithium ion and other emerging technologies lower in cost, they will become more suitable for higher powered vehicles. You've talked a lot about electrification and hybridization. Have you noticed any trends in certain markets like material handling, construction, and agriculture? 
In material handling, electrification is very mature. In example, class one, two, and three equipment, which include rider trucks, narrow aisle trucks, and hand or hand rider trucks, respectively. Mitsubishi and Toyota both have hybrid product in market, and Mitsubishi suggests that hybrid technology is best suited in the four to five ton lift capacity, where greater than six ton is best suited for diesel application. Mitsubishi is reporting a 39% reduction in fuel consumption compared to diesel options. Much of this is engine idling inefficiency. I expect more electric and hybrid options to come to market as technology improves. In construction, there is greater potential for electrification because of the additional costs of diesel engines meeting stage five and the noise restrictions for operation in densely populated areas. Suitable electrification technologies for some applications already exist, such as hybrid excavators, which are relatively mature. Higher powered construction equipment can adopt technologies from these existing applications to electrify. Cummins is investing in battery electric and range extended vehicle options. John Deere Electronic Systems offers 750 volt inverters up to 300 kilowatts. For large agricultural equipment, electrification can be quite challenging to convert to electric in the near term. This is due to the high costs as the technology from commercial vehicle industries are not cost effective yet. However, with improvements in technologies, agricultural equipment may electrify in the long run. Since we've touched base on electrification and hybridization, could you explain the difference between electric and hybrid equipment and give some real life examples? Sure, let's first go over all electric vehicles. A battery electric vehicle functions with an electric motor driving the wheels or hydraulics and a motor controller managing the torque and rotational speed of the motor with DC power from the battery packs. There are no internal combustion engines, fuel cell, or fuel tank. All electric machines are currently used for lower powered applications and are well established in golf carts, scissor lifts, aerial work platforms, and floor care machines. Some OEMs are starting to release all electric versions of compact construction equipment and ride on lawnmowers. Improvements in lead battery technology and lower cost lithium technologies are supporting OEMs with these innovations. As battery technology evolves, bigger machines will leverage these technologies to take advantage of lower operating costs, more compact designs, less maintenance and improved durability. EasyGo is the first Gulf OEM to adopt lithium on its electric carts using lithium cells and packs from Samsung. EasyGo has offered an unlimited amp hour five year warranty on these lithium packs. Lithium also reduces maintenance costs versus the lead equivalents by not requiring battery monitoring and terminal cleaning and is over 50% more efficient than the lead battery powered equivalent electric carts. Not all products benefit from the weight reduction, but as weight is burdensome to the turf, the switch to lithium has shaved over 100 kilograms off the lead packs traditionally used. Golf courses are seeing less maintenance costs and significantly less operating cost with lithium adoption. Last year we saw Ryobi launch an electric ride-on mower using lead batteries, and this year Troy Bill released the first lithium ion battery powered riding mower. Troy Built is taking advantage of the lithium opportunity charging characteristic of lithium packs, pitching charge it whenever the mower doesn't mind. This 56 volt 30 amp hour pack takes four to six hours to charge and offers a one hour cutting time. This electric mower offers a headlight and a USB charging port, something you don't see on gas powered mowers. Another electric example from the compact construction industry is Wacker Newson's WL20E wheel loader. It is the first purely electrically operated wheel loader from Wacker Newson. This articulating wheel loader works completely exhaust free and with significantly lower noise levels than internal combustion engine equivalents. It boasts a five hour run time, eight hour charge time, and a 41% operating cost improvement over a 2800 hour operation period, which includes a mid life cycle battery replacement. For the end user, this means greater flexibility in application use case, environmental protection, 
and significant operating cost savings. Now that we've discussed electric vehicles, let's go over the hybrid vehicles. Compared to electric only vehicles, hybrid vehicles use both an internal combustion engine and an electric motor to obtain maximum power and fuel economy with minimum emissions and manage the range or operation time expectations. Electric hybrids are a perfect choice for higher power applications that can't rely on electric only because of high peak power demand or a long operational uptime requirement. These systems offer the best of both worlds, petrol power when you need it and quiet operation when you need that. A great example of a hybrid electric vehicle is Genie's Z60 37FE Boom, which launched in 2016. Since then, the market has been shifting to accommodate the technology. The mid-size Z Boom family is adopted from customers' evolving needs for true 4x4 performance for indoor, outdoor, and low emissions operation. This is a plug-in serial hybrid product which has a 24 horsepower diesel engine driving an AC motor slash generator. The AC motor drives the hydraulic pump for lifting and the generator to charge the batteries for electrical energy for the wheels. The unit is driven by four individual electric motor hubs attached to the wheels for true 4x4 performance and offers regenerative braking. In electric only mode, this unit can run for eight hours on an overnight charge, offers significant operational cost improvements, and meets the needs of greener city requirements and stage five regulations. GLG also has a hybrid lift product. They recently launched the world's largest hybrid boom, the H800AJ with an 80 foot lift height. The machine has an 84 volt system and can operate in electric mode only and has a 21 kilowatt electric motor generator and an 18 kilowatt diesel. It is a parallel hybrid, meaning the diesel engine and the electric motor generator drive the hydraulic system, leveraging the components from the existing diesel only options. This hybrid style was chosen due to the high cost and scarce availability of electric powertrains in this size of machine. Smaller JLG hybrid products offer series hybrid systems where electric motors drive each wheel. The last example we'll be going over is range extender vehicles. Range extenders extend the vehicle's range when batteries are depleted, which are for applications that need longer operational time than offered in the current affordable battery technology. A range extender is similar to a series hybrid except the internal combustion engine doesn't drive the vehicle. It only adds electrical power to the electric or battery system. The most commonly used range extenders are small internal combustion engines, but micro turbines and hydrogen fuel cells are on a few automotive products. I expect that applications that are least likely to have plug-in access to evaluate or adopt this technology like forestry, boating, and marine. Now I'll hand it back to Akasha to wrap things up. Thank you, Graham. Before we wrap up our presentation, let's review some key points from today's webinar. The Stage 5 regulation will be the most stringent law for non-road mobile machinery. OEMs will need to comply between January 2019 to January 2021. Some OEMs are already starting to release all electric versions of compact construction equipment and ride on lawn mowers. As battery technology evolves, bigger machines may leverage these technologies to take advantage of lower operating costs, more compact designs, less maintenance, and improved durability. Material handling and construction equipment have a greater potential for electrification because of cost and noise restrictions for operation in densely populated areas. Agricultural equipment electrification above 15 kilowatts is challenging because of the very high development cost. As we close out our webinar today, please remember to submit your questions to marketing at deltaq.com. We've also created a frequently asked questions document, which we will send to you after the webinar is over. If you would like to learn more about Delta Q technologies, please feel free to contact us via email or phone. That concludes our webinar for today, and thank you for tuning in. In the next slide, you will be able to see our list of references which you can review. We hope you have found this webinar to be helpful. Thank you.